say it looks like this is on. Record and it's new and it's number seven. I'll put that there. And I'll turn I'll turn this guy on. This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Wednesday, April the 22nd here at the Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is Neil O'Shea and I'm a member of the reference staff and I'm speaking with Mr. Uh, Matthew Wytasek. Uh, Mr. Wytasek uh, was born on January the 27th, uh, 1922. Right. And uh, he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this Veterans History uh, project here at the Niles Library. Uh, this interview is taking place in the group study room uh, off of the reference department and we're um, very appreciative that Mr. Wojtasek uh, was able to come uh, this afternoon and uh, his son-in-law Hank drove him to the interview and he's going to pick him up uh, afterwards. Um, anyway, we'll move on to the suggested uh, questions here. And so, Mr. Wytasek, uh when did you enter military service? Uh, in 1942. In 1942, I was drafted. I didn't enlist, I was drafted. My number was called and uh, my friends and neighbors invited me to get into the service. <laughs> where, were you, where were you living at that time? I was living in Chicago, Illinois. Were you on the north side? On the north side, in uh, uh, what do you call that side there? Around St. Joseph's Parish, St. Alphonsus, and oh. St. Vincent de Paul. What? Oh yeah, kind of Lincoln Park, or West the Lincoln, Lincoln Park. Park yeah, yeah, there, yeah, yeah. yeah. The um, what did, ha, were you attending high school at that time, or had you finished high school? I, I just finished high school in 1940, and then uh, I thought I'd uh, instead of going to college, I went to the Art Institute of Chicago. I thought I'd be some kind of an artist. I was going to go for a bachelor of fine arts degree, but uh, in the meantime, uh, my dad was paying the tuition, and uh, I, I hated to see him pay all that money for tuition. So I I got a job in the meantime, and. Uh, I worked, you know, so I would get a little tuition, and that, that's when I, I got the call that I was, you know, being drafted. Yeah. What what high school did you attend? I went to Holy Trinity High School on Division Street. Oh yeah, yeah. That was that. Think that high school was still going at the last time I checked. It's still going now. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. It, at, at one time it was all mostly all Polish students over there. Now it's everything. The League of Nations. Yeah. So your background is. Ethnically, is Polish. Polish, right? Polish, right. Yeah. My father and father came from Poland. They, uh, they're immigrants from Poland. They became citizens and stayed here till, well, till they died. So, uh, did they come over after World War One or before World War One? Well, my my dad had, uh, he had to sign up for World War, but he was never called. So it was around that time that uh, you know that he was yeah. here. Were you, uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? Yes, I had one brother and one sister, and I was the youngest. My brother was the oldest, my sister was in the middle, and I was the youngest, of course, and uh, uh, they're all deceased right now. My, my brother lived till he was 85, my sister died at uh, 60, 65, and my father, he died at uh, 85, too, so. So and I'm 87, so I'm living longer. Great, yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite so an accomplishment. It is. <laughs> uh, yeah, when you consider you went through what you went through in yeah. World War II. Did, um, was your brother in the service at all? No, no, no. He, he, he didn't make it. So, um, what, what, how did the family feel about you going into the service? It was just something well, that... everybody else was going, so that they, they took it in, in a light, you know, right manner. Yeah, so you wound up in the Army, was that right? In the U.S. Army? Yeah, U.S. Army, right. Did you choose the Army or you were just assigned to the Army? Well, I, yeah, I, I they, they chose for me. I mean, if you enlisted, 
he had the option of uh, either enlisting into the Air Corps, the Navy, or Marines. You know, that would be different. But I just let things go the way they would go. I, so I, I got into the Army. So you were inducted at, uh, where were you inducted? Downtown somewhere or? Uh... No, uh, at the draft, well, it, I, I guess the induction took place over there where we, you know, raised our hand and, and allegiance and all that kind of stuff. And then they sent you off to, to boot camp somewhere? Well, I first started out at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. When my draft called, called me up and told me that uh, I should report to their office and we're only the clothes that you got on. Don't bring anything else because you're going to have breakfast here and then you're going to go to Fort Sheridan, Illinois and you're probably going to send your clothing back home and we're going to fit you with an army uniform. And that, that they did. So I, uh, I sit here for a short time. There's orientation and army talk and all that stuff. And soon it was time for me to to go for basic training. They sent me to Fort Bragg in North Carolina where I would join the 82nd Airborne Division. And uh, at this time, they were starting something new in warfare. It would be uh, what they called Airborne. And it would consist of uh, glider troopers and paratroopers. The Germans and Russians were already using this type of warfare and we were starting to get into it too. So uh, this was a new kind of a warfare for for, for the army, had you ever been in a plane before? No, no, that that that's the the, the fun of it, you know. I mean, I, I never flew, and uh, here I'm flying in a glider towed by a C-47 airplane. Oh, it was a big thrill for me. Yeah. I liked it. Now, you and I are not too tall. No, you and I are not too tall. I'm just wondering if they chose you for the for the glider because you weren't. A heavyweight person. No, I was only 128 pounds when I went into the service. When I come out, I was 148, so I didn't gain a whole lot. But you, do you think your height or weight had anything that to do? Didn't, that didn't have any difference. Nothing to do with it. So, um, how did you, uh, how did you enjoy, if that's the word, uh, boot camp and basic training? Was that pleasant or? Yeah, basic training is what they call it. boot camp. Is usually in uh, Navy. Thank it's you. a Navy term. Yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I met a lot of friends and we made a lot of, you know, a lot of good uh, choices over there. Was that the first time you'd ever been away from home for an extended period of time? Yes, it was for, for that period of time. So you met all kinds of different people from different oh, parts of the country, I suppose. Almost every state. Well, all American means that there was soldiers in there from every state in the Union, from all 48 states. You know, there was somebody from all the states. That's why it was called the All-American Division. And did you get along with everybody? Everybody got yeah, along? And I, no I got along pretty good. I, I'm an easygoing person, and uh, I make friends easily. So, I mean, I had no problems. And uh, the food was okay? The food was good. For me, it was good. And uh, no complaints. <laughs> and you weren't exhausted from, uh, from doing all the basic training or anything like that? Yeah, I had the basic training at Fort Bragg. Yeah, was that tiring? Was it pretty tough? Yeah. Well, that, that, that lasted a short time. As soon as after basic training, we got got the order that uh, Airborne. we would be going overseas. So uh, they cut the basic training short and uh, we were on our way to uh, for overseas duty. First we from we, by train we went to Camp Edwards in Massachusetts where we were fitted with uh, khaki clothing. Khaki clothing is usually worn in warm areas and, and summer clothing, you know, in the States here. So uh, I was figuring we might be going to a, a warm place, you know, like, well, whatever, wherever the warm place is. But anyway, from, uh, from there they, we went to the uh, ports in New York where we boarded uh, ships, troop ships, and uh, we got on the troop ships. I think it was the USS George Washington. And uh, nothing was happening. We're sitting there. Night, nightfall came, and we went down in the hole, uh, get some shut eye. They had tears of you know guys. There's so many on that ship over there. And towards morning, you you felt the movement of the ship and a splashing in the water on the sides of the, the ship. You know, oh, what's this? Ran upstairs to see what's happening. And just in time to 
We've been fighting the Statue of Liberty. We're on our way. We're, we were sailing the Atlantic Ocean. So was the U.S. George Washington, was that a troop carrier? It was ship? a troop, troop ship, yeah. I, I, they said it was, a, it was uh, an old one from World War I that was uh, taken from Germany. So I don't know. So you had uh, been drafted, you entered the service in December of 42. 42, right. So is it, is it in early 43 then that you're heading for Europe? Would yeah, you say yeah. probably? Right. And then did you go to England or North Africa? Or well, the thing is, uh, there was German submarines and U-boats in the area looking to ship to sink our shipping. And uh, we didn't make a straight line to where we were going. We zigzagged, you know, kind of fooling. So after a couple of days uh, on, on the, in the Atlantic Ocean over there, we, uh, we were given pamphlets how to speak French. And... Uh, the guy with a loudspeaker would, would say how, how to pronounce, you know, those French terms, they're, they're kind of hard. Yeah. And uh, we would say them over and over and over again. And then I'm thinking to myself, hey, we must be going to France. But at this time, the Germany had occupied all of France, so that was a no-no. I don't think we are going there. But then we, we did end up in a port of Casablanca. French North Africa. So that's why the French pamphlet was because the, in Casablanca they spoke French and Arabic. Did you have any problems with being seasick or anything like that? No, no. <laughs> so that probably took what about a week or a week or ten days to make that zigzag to North 12, Africa. Twelve days. Twelve days. Twelve days. Zigzag, you know, all the way to Casablanca. So after Casablanca, we uh, we stayed there for a short time and went to another place. A camp called uh, Ujda, O U J D A, and uh, we lived in pup tents. As far as you could see, the one man pup tent, you know, one man to a pup tent. And as far as you could see, the pup tents were all lined up over there. And uh, was it pretty warm at that time? Pretty hot? Yeah, it was warm, hot. And the trouble over there was uh, there were scorpions around there, and they like to nibble on your toes there. So some of the guys they, they slept with their boots on, so they wouldn't get you know bit by the scorpions. But you didn't. No, no, I I just let things go. If I got bit, I got bit. <laughs> so all those people in those big lines of pup tents, those are all airborne. All airborne, yeah. All airborne. Eighty second, right? Yeah. So let me, if I can just ask. When you were going through basic training, you didn't know that you were going to be airborne at that time, did you? When you were starting, when I, when, yeah. When I was, when I got the basic training, they I said that. you're airborne there. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. it was airborne out at the 82nd Airborne. So from the beginning, you knew. Yeah, yeah. they put me in the 82nd Airborne Division. Yeah. So you, so when you jump, when you're on a glider coming in, do you wait till it lands, or do you have to jump down? No, you don't jump. It's, it's not like the helicopters that they use today. The helicopter comes down. And even before it touches the ground, these guys, uh, they call that assault, assault troops. They just jump to the ground, you know, and, and start firing or whatever they, they have to do. But uh, we would land. And so uh, while you were in, in Casablanca or in uh, Camp Ujda, Ujda, were you doing any yeah, any we glider practice, practice yeah, there or something? We, glider, glider practice there. And paratroopers were, were making jumps over there. We stayed there for a short time. Then we moved to a, another place further down. Uh, what was the name of that place? Uh, Cairo Ant. Cairo Ant. That was another camp where we did some same, some of the same stuff we were doing here. But we we hit there at a lucky time. Bob Hope was having a show over there for us. So we got to see the Bob Hope show, which was great. There was uh, Francis Langford, Jerry Colonna. Jerry Colonna, wow. Yeah, Jerry Oh, they, they were funny and uh, a lot of nice, you know, dancing girls and everything. Oh, we really enjoyed that show. So after Cairo and we went into Tunisia. We pushed into Tunisia. And from Tunisia, we trained there a little bit. And uh, then they took us to the air, airports where we made the invasion into Sicily. So that was the first airborne operation for us into Sicily, by by air and by sea. So that was in, uh, was that in like May or June of '43, or when do you? I wonder when that was the Sicilian. I can't think now. That invasion. Yeah. 
Yeah. But did that? So you? So your? The first time you landed on enemy ground was in. Was yeah. Well, I came by sea that time. I, I didn't see. go by glider. But but there were glider troopers coming in and paratroopers coming through. But uh, yeah, we. It's covered in. I think Patton was in Sicily too, wasn't he? Patton, General Patton. Yeah, was in Patton Sicily. was. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> he did. He did that British general uh, a lot of dirt. Yeah, Montgomery. Yeah, yeah Montgomery. Yeah, yeah. He, he, they didn't get along at all. They didn't yeah. get along at all. No. So, if you're invading something or attacking, how do you use the how do you use the paratroopers and the gliders to the or who goes in? Well, the gliders are in a C-47 by themselves and. Uh, the gliders are are towed by C 47s, but there's no no paratroopers in there. They we we're just above treetops coming in there at 100 miles an hour. And when you hit the ground, you know, you, you, you stop in a hurry. And that could be in front of enemy lines or behind enemy lines. Yeah, or well, a lot of times it mostly was behind enemy lines. So when you hit the ground or when you get off the, the yeah, glider, you're, you're what do you ready, what ready. kind of armaments do you right. have? Do you have and, a, and the thing you want to do is get out of that glider as fast as possible because uh, the Germans, if there's Germans in the area, they're they're lobbing these here, you know, all kind of uh, 88s and uh, mortar shells, you know. So yeah. you want to get get away from that. So what do you what do you carry when you're in the, in the glider? Well, M1. I, I had a, a 30 caliber carbine. Full folding stock carbine, 30 caliber. But there's no backpack or anything like that? Is there no, a backpack? No, no. Just, just what I had in my pockets over there, food and whatever, you know, because we were only supposed to be there for, you know, a short time. Well, then how do you get out? Well, the thing is, we didn't get out. Uh, after things settled in Sicily, uh, the Germans and Italian troops, at that time Italians and Germans mm -hmm. were fighting as a, as a team. Well, they, they started to retreat, and we started to follow them. So uh, they got in into the big booth of Italy itself, and uh, we followed them. We got in at Salerno. Uh, we got in at Salerno. We fought all the way up to Naples, Italy, and uh, things were going so so good. Uh, General Mark Clark was very satisfied with, with the way the 82nd Airborne Division, you know, did war, and he wanted to keep them, but... Uh, we figured, hey, the way things are going, maybe we'll be, Rome will be next. But it wasn't to be. Uh, they got orders that they wanted an airborne operation. At this time, the Russians were, were being pressured by the Germans. They were moving in on them, and the, the Russians wanted us to open up a second front, and that would be Normandy. So they took us out of, they pulled us out of Naples, Italy, sent us back to the British Isles, and we sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar, and, uh, and we ended up in uh, Northern Ireland first. And we stayed around Belfast for a time, and then after that we, we shipped over to to England proper, and we stayed around Leicester, where we trained some more over there, and it was getting close to June, and as soon as June 6th came, we were, went to the Air Force, on the British Air Force, on and uh, or English Channel heading for Normandy. That was so June, June, June 6, 1944, D-Day. And I was a part of that D-Day operation. Yeah, one of the veterans was telling me that they kind of, um, they knew something was up, but yeah. they never, you didn't know exactly when it was going to be. They didn't know where it was going to and be. And then they, they, they gave them some false runs. Yeah, right. And yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. then they were so glad to hear we're finally going. They were, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, so you, you were flown by uh, the C-47 out of out of Leicester. Did you did you start? Oh, no. uh, when you crossed well, the Well, the airports in England, right? Not out of Leicester. It's it's, it's they were on you know mm -hmm. in various spots over there in England. So they. So when you got into France, that was, you were uh, you were uh, as a glider troop. Yeah, we we landed behind the enemy lines, and uh, we uh, see the first thing, the first ones to go out there are the pathfinders. Now these pathfinders are paratroopers that are schooled in uh, in what do you call that? Uh, 
where you hone in on something, uh, radars, radar systems. They, they were schooled in, in the radar systems, and uh, they would paratroop, parachute down in uh, designated areas, drop zones for the paratroopers, landing zone or LZ for, for the landing zone for the gliders. And uh, as we would be flying over the English Channel toward Normandy, we would hone in on these radar systems and we would know where, to, where, where about to land. So whose radar systems were those? Were those the German radar? Your no, own ours, radar? ours. Yes, you guys set yeah, these up. Our pathfinders. So you, when you come in on, so a, a C-47, it, it tows one glider? Yeah. He, how cuts, how he cuts the tow line and he goes back to England to get some more gliders or more paratroopers. And we're on our way down. There's no place to go but down. <laughs> how many people are on the glider? How many troops? Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah, like a pilot, co-pilot, and the rest of our riflemen. So when you land, do you recall where you landed in, in France when you came over? It came up right side up. Some of them landed upside down. Some hit trees, some hit buildings. They had all the kind of stakes put up there too and to disrupt you know, our landing where the, it would turn over to glide. So were you near uh, San Mary Glees or some one of those towns, do you recall? Or Yeah, we, 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 uh, we landed it around St. Mary Glees. Yeah. And the paratroopers landed almost on top of St. Mary Glees. Yeah. And we landed somewhere over there. And I'll, it was for us to uh, take over the railroad stations and uh, byways and highways. You know, we had to watch so the Germans, if they would retreat, they couldn't, you know, get very far. And then, of course, we had to turn around this way because reinforcements might be coming from the other way. So we, we were fighting both sides. Were you scared? Being young, I mean, you don't you don't have that fear, it seems. Now I fear, but uh, at that time I didn't. So did you meet with a lot of resistance then when you were, uh, when you landed or when you moved out no, to the railroad? No, not very not much, much. Not very much. As a matter of fact, we only stayed in, uh, in Nor Normandy about uh, a little over a month, maybe 33 days. See, the airborne operation was over. So we, we, we came in there about after midnight, and by that time, the seaborne troops were coming up the beaches. Uh, there's five beaches: Omaha, Utah, Gold, Sword, and uh, you know, or, uh, Sword, Sword, yeah. And uh, Omaha and Utah would be operated by by the Americans, yeah. and the other three would be taken over by the British, Canadian, French, and Polish soldiers. So. That, that was that was it. So then, um, were you injured any time? No, no. Thank God. Yeah. I was lucky. Yeah. yeah. So they. So the troops get the land troops get ashore, and then your your unit is then moved somewhere else. Yeah. Well, when these when these troops are coming up, uh, seaborne troops are coming up. Oh, they had. They were bringing up uh, more infantry divisions. They were bringing up tanks, trucks, supplies, and everything. Finally, they made a breakthrough, and that, that's when we left. And uh, there was another oper uh, airborne operation waiting for us. They sent us back to England from from France. But by boat or by plane? Yeah, by boat. Yeah. And uh, once again, we did the same type of training. And uh, in September, three months after D-Day, June 6th, in September, about, about the middle of September, about 15th or 17th, somewhere, there, we made a drop into Holland. That was called Operation Market Garden. And uh, that one went good. Uh, there were bridges that we had to take and hold because the Germans, they had it all dynamited, you know, they were going to blow them up so that we couldn't follow them or we would, they would halt us from, you know, reaching them in a hurry. Yeah. The British were involved in that too, weren't they? Yeah, Mark, yeah Mark, the yeah. British, the 101st Airborne too. Yeah. And that was successful? Yeah. How did you get out of there? How did you, how did you move out of, uh, out of Holland then? Did they? Well, the thing is, uh, they, they, were, they were thinking, hey, after Africa, Sicily, Italy, Normandy, and now uh, Holland, 
it's time for these guys to get a rest. You know, I mean, we, we lost a lot of men on the way, and uh, it was time to get replacements and stuff. So what they did was sent us, the 82nd Airborne Division, back to France on an R&R. &R. And uh, we, we, they took us to Sasson. And, uh, oh, life was good over there. I mean, we, we got to sleep in real beds. We had uh, hot baths, hot showers, good food, had uh, CSO shows, you know. And I got to see Maurice Chevalier, Follies Bourgere, and uh, even uh, Marlene Dietrich. Yeah, I got yeah. to see all these people. They visited us over there, and uh, yeah, life was good, but that didn't last long. All of a sudden, we were alerted that the 101st Airborne was uh, being surrounded by the Germans. The Germans were making a breakthrough. They were trying to get to Antwerp. Yeah. That was a port. And if they could get to Antwerp, they could bring in supplies and more reinforcements over there. But the, the 101st Airborne, they kind of held back there. Eventually, uh, overnight, we were alerted. We packed up and headed for uh, for Belgium. And we entered a war at uh, in a place called Wurvelmont. And so was that by train or by bus or by car? No, by truck. By Long truck. trailers, open air trailers. And we, there were no lights and pitch black. You weren't allowed to smoke or light yeah. a flashlight or anything, you know. And uh, no lights were on the trucks. They had just little slits of, on the tail lights where one truck, can, you know, one, one trailer could follow another one in, in darkness. And you could hear the drones of German planes out there, you know, trying to find out where, where we were, what we were doing, and trying to knock us out. So that's how you participated in the Battle, Battle of the Bulge. Bulge. Right, right. But you participated in the Bulge as like a an army, so a land-based yeah, soldier. Did. General Patton was even there too. George yeah. Patton was in there too. Yeah. And eventually, uh, we started to drive the Germans uh, back. They started to retreat a little bit. They got them out there. They were uh, advancing to the rear. They were going back into Germany, and uh, we were following them. And uh, by this time, it was. Uh, already in May, and uh, the German army finally surrendered, and the uh, whole divisions were surrendering to the 82nd Airborne Division, and uh, on May 8th, it was the end of the war, and it was what they call VE Day, Victory Europe, and uh, it was time, well, the, now the war was over, and uh, in Europe, that is, the war was still going on in, uh, in the Pacific over there. Because that war didn't end in, until August when, uh, when, when how do you call it, the President Thurman Truman dropped them bombs over there and the Japanese gave up. Yeah. But, uh, you know, now we had so many men in, uh, in, in Europe, there was no need for that. So they come up with a, you know, how did they get rid of some of these men? There, it was time to discharge some. They come up with a, with a point system. You had to have 85 points to get out. This would be years of service and medals that you got and, uh, you know, how many, how long you were in the service and all that kind of stuff. So you had to have 85 points. I, come, I had 81 points. I was four short. So I, I couldn't go. So the guys that had 85 and more, they shipped them back to the States. And we, on, on the other hand, the rest of the division that was under 85 points, we went to Berlin, Germany for occupation duty. So I stayed there for several months and uh, until I got 91, I had 91 points and they tapped me on the shoulder and said, okay, you're ready to go. So from there, they trained me to uh, Le Havre in France, I boarded a Liberty ship, off to New York we went. But that trip to New York was shorter than the one, you know, no going to Casablanca. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that was a 12 days. This this was a short trip. It was a liberty ship. Yeah. So did you ever uh, wind up speaking any French when you were in France? Did the, those language lessons ever come yeah, in uh, handy? Uh, very little, very, very little. little. They, you know, those people spoke English over there. In Germany, too. I mean, they spoke fluent English, real yeah. good. I guess they, they teach in school English. Yeah. All of them countries. I mean, uh, they're real nice people. Very. So you don't, um, you don't, you say when you're young, you don't, it, you don't have a lot of times you don't have fear. Yeah, right. You know, as a matter of fact, I I never felt that I was going to die. I never felt that I was going to get killed. That's a that's a funny reason, but uh, yeah. that's the way it was. So when 
On D Day, then your your C forty seven that left during the night. Yeah, yeah. The, the yeah night? Around three o'clock in the morning. Three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Well, that yeah. must have been exciting or something. Oh yeah, it was. But when we were coming in there, it was it was nice flying. It was you know smooth. As soon as we hit the coast of of Normandy over there, everything started to come up over there. Tracer bullets and uh, ack ack and whatever you know everything. And then tracer bullets, they, every fifth bullet is got a light on it's it. It's a marker, so, yeah. And it shows you the direction where you're shooting in. Yeah. And when you look down over there, it looks like everyone has come right for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of scary. Yeah. So did your unit suffer a lot of casualties? The 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 82nd suffered a lot of casualties? Uh, not as much as some of the other outfits. Yeah. We were, we were kind of lucky in that respect. Was the was the invasion of Normandy was that the roughest or the bloodiest yeah. for your unit? Yeah, I think that that was so. Uh, yeah, we lost quite a few men over there. Yeah. And then how did you find the uh, how did you find the German people when you were on occupation were duty friendly. in Berlin? As a matter of fact, when we were in Berlin, Germany, it was almost like being home. The center of of Berlin, all the buildings were stand that were standing were just four walls, brick you know brick walls. The insides were all burned out by the incendiary bombs that our, you know, Air Force lit down on them. So we lived on the outskirts of uh, Berlin, and uh, the uh, we lived in a, in a kind of apartment building. So that was kind of nice too. We had uh, slept in beds and had hot showers and whatever. And we even had a nightclub of our own. I mean, uh, we had uh, beer that would be brought into us and. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, well, most of the guys had German girlfriends. They would bring their girlfriends in there. We, they would dance. They would drink beer and everything. Like, oh. I uh, suppose some of them might have married some of them. I some of them did. A couple yeah. of war brides. Yeah. But most of them, if they married anybody, it would be a British girl. British girl. British or Irish girl. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, so you, you received a bronze star, bronze stars for the operation in Normandy and for the uh, market garden in uh, yeah. in Holland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that trip back on the Liberty ship that must have been fun. I mean, thinking you're going nice. home. That was real nice. We hit the hit the port in New York. They put down the gangplank, and as we were coming down the gangplank, there was military bands playing all good military music, man. You threw out your chest, you felt good. Some of the guys went there and he kissed the ground, you know, glad to be back home. Yeah. And uh, from there we stayed for a short time. They they tried to fatten us up. We went to Camp Gilmer in New Jersey where they had the best food you could you could ever want. And uh, But there was a sign saying, eat as much as you want, but make sure that you eat everything that you take. There will be no waste. So you made sure that you ate everything. And uh, shortly after that, uh, it was time to get get close to a base that would be close to your home. The guys were getting dip going to different places in, in the U.S. And I, I was scheduled to go to Fort Sheridan, which was my home base. And uh, But there were so many being discharged at that time that, uh, that they couldn't handle it. So they sent us to Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. I was uh, discharged in Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. So you had you make your way your own way home from Camp then, then they, they they give us our discharge papers at Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. He gave us a train fare to get home, and I took a train and got back to Chicago, downtown Chicago. <laughs> wow, you, I suppose you can remember that day coming yeah. coming out to. Boy, that was nice. Yeah. So did you take the train or the bus home from downtown? I think I think it was streetcars. Streetcars, yeah, streetcars at that time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, during the war, were you able to write home at all? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. As much as you want. As a matter of fact, they made me a, a postal clerk. So I I, I had mail. I I pick up the mail at the, at the station there and uh, call a mail call and hand out the mail to the guys and make money orders for them and stuff. Yeah. So when you uh, when you came back to civilian life, then did you have a hard time adjusting to being back? back? In, no, being, no, no, not at all. Not at no, all. I, you know, when I came home, see, my father was living by himself. He was a widower. He had a flat of his own, and my sister asked him to come and live with her. So he did come to live with my sister, and I 
didn't have no place to go. I didn't have a home because he gave up that that you know apartment that he was living in, and my sister invited me to stay over there. So I stayed there until I got married in '46, and then uh, I moved to Niles. I've been in Niles now for 35 years. Yeah. So did you? Uh, you mentioned that you were thinking of going. Are you? Or you had started some courses at the Art Institute. What was Before that? you went in the Army, you were talking about, you mentioned that you were taking courses, you wanted to get a degree in fine yeah. arts. Yeah. Did you think of going back to school on no, a GI no, no. Bill? I, I, had no, I lost my interest in that. I, wow. I, yeah. Well, the thing is, my, my girlfriend, my, my childhood sweetheart, wanted to get married and all that, so when I got married, I, I had to get a job, you know. And yeah. So you married your childhood sweetheart? Yeah. So had she ever since, seen you in uniform? Yeah, yeah since, it, since seventh, eighth grade there, yeah. we've been going on all that time. Of course, we had our, you know, arguments and stuff yeah. where we'd break off. She'd go with other guys, I'd go with other girls, but yeah. uh, eventually we always got together, you know. So I Did she go to Holy Trinity also? Yeah, she, yeah, she, she, she lived on the same street that I did. Uh, wow. And um, so she saw you in your uniform then? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I wrote, wrote her all the time. Center pictures from over there and stuff. Yeah. So, um, so when you came back here, you you must have did you you must have kept up with some of your 82nd Airborne yeah, I, I, friends. Yeah, I I tried to, and uh, there was five that I was writing to, and they were writing back to me. I get like Christmas cards and a little letter here and there, but uh, there's only three that I I know that are still alive and. Uh, I don't know about the rest. We had a big uh, battery, so I mean, I don't know if they're all gone or they just don't. Uh... So then you joined the veterans organization. You, jo yeah. you, you joined oh, yeah. the veterans of foreign wars. Oh yeah, I, I joined American Legion, Vet Niles Veterans of Foreign Wars, the National Chapter of the 82nd Airborne Division, plus the Chicago Chapter 82nd, and then. Uh, this year outfit here too that I, I joined. Veterans of the Battle of the Bronx. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that outfit. Yeah. 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 So when you when you came home, I think you mentioned that you went to work for the the U.S. Where I, where I worked before I went into the service. Yeah. yeah. It was a it, they made nameplates. Over there, and uh, I, I, I stayed there for a while, and then I was figuring, you know, then when I took that exam for a post office job, that was your wife's suggestion that you take the yeah, exam. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I was wait. The, the pay was about the same. I was getting here, and then I would we'd get, which was a low pay at that time. It wouldn't get very much, but anyway, I decided to take the post office job and quit this one because. Uh, here, there was no pension, no health benefits, and the post office, I had security. I had a pension, I had uh, health benefits, and with 30 years of service and 55 years of age, you could retire. But I stayed there for 44 years. 44 years. Do you think there was any connection between your being the postal clerk when you were passing out I, the I mail in the sure army. About and then, that, you know, yeah. Because it's on my discharge paper that I you know, I did postal work in there. Yeah. That might have been influence, you know. To that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're coming to the end of the interview now. And we always ask these questions. Um, how do you think your military services your military service and the experiences you had there, how do you think it affected your life? Well, I, I think it, it disciplined me more. I, um, I'm more disciplined. I'm not wild or nothing like that. I, in, in many ways, it was good. I mean, uh, I, I enjoyed the military life and uh, met a lot of nice people. It was a good life, and uh, but I was good, good to get out of it too. Yeah. You never considered making a career in the military. Oh no, no, no. no. Yeah. When when I got discharged, that was it. See ya. Yeah. So, um, do you think your military experience influence, influences your thinking about war or about well, military yeah, in general? Well, that's, that's another thing. Like when we were when we were in Germany, close to the end of the war, when we were meeting the Russians 
at the Elbe River, before we met them at the Elbe River, we came upon a concentration camp, Ludwig's Lust. And uh, we, we, we went in there, we liberated it, and uh, oh, the people there were, were dying and they were dead. People stacked up, you know, in buildings and, and, and makeshift, uh, you know, beds and stuff like that. And the smell was terrific. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, the, the name of the camp was Wobelin, W-O-B-L-I-N. And it was in Ludwig's Lust, Germany. And uh, by, by this time, most of the Germans that were in that, concentration camp, they already retreated. They were, you know, leaving. Well, and yeah. what was left over there, the guards and stuff, we took them as prisoners. POWs. But that, that was about the most horrible thing I've seen over there. Yeah. Mostly, I think, Jewish, Polish, Romanian, just about every kind of nationality that didn't agree with the Nazis, you know, they put them in concentration camps. Is there anything you'd like to add to the interview that you have that we haven't talked about? No, I can't think of anything. Well, were, were there any times that were really, really funny? I mean, uh, a good joke, or I suppose. Pe yeah, I, I'm trying to think of something, but uh, nothing seems to come to my brain. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose a, a good sense of humor helps. Yeah, yeah. as soon as I leave, something like that, I'll think of something. The, um, did you find that a lot of the people, a lot of your uh, uh, Army friends were they very religious in the war? Were yeah, they, were they, well, as a matter of fact, they pray know, a lot. And uh, one thing that that uh, I thought was real nice were the chaplains. I mean, if you were in trouble or you wanted to have a letter written home or something, you'd go to the Catholic priest, you'd go to a Protestant minister, you'd go to a rabbi. They were superb. I mean, they would help you in every way they could. They're real, real nice. I. I I, I really, you know, looked out for them. So the American, uh, the American clergy or whatever, the yeah, religious, yeah. they also contributed yeah. to the war effort. Oh yeah, and uh, like uh, before we went into service, into the war zone, uh, like I was a Catholic, and uh, we'd have a mass said. Uh, the priest would set up an altar on the front end of a jeep, you know, candles and crucifix and everything like that, and uh, we'd have mass and. Hand out communion, and uh, before we ended the service, he gave us a, a general absolution. He made us feel sorry for our sins, and he gave us a general absolution. You know that if, if we we felt that if we got killed, we go straight to heaven. So I mean that 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 was a good feeling. Yeah, know? being in a state of grace. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Wow. I just keep thinking must, what it must have been like to be in that glider being towed over the English Channel <laughs> early in the night of yeah. D-Day morning. Well, the thing wow. is, we never, had, we, we didn't have parachutes. That was the bad thing, you know. Well, uh, we, oh, we flew too low. A parachute wouldn't do any good because you'd hit the ground before the parachute would open. So that, that was the good thing. But, uh, yeah, it, paratroopers, at least they had a par parachute to jump out with, you know. But they, they were at a greater height. Where the parachute open. And then they had these other, uh, other ones you know, that they could open up and just throw it out there at a lower height. Did you ever have to wear those May West? That's what I was thinking of. I couldn't think of it. A May, that, that's all we had in the glider, a May West. You would press a thing like that and it would blow up. And, and in case we had to ditch the glider, like while fly, flying over the English Channel, if we had to ditch the glider in the water, we would, you know would drop because I can't swim anyway, so I would drop. Good thing you're in the arms. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Mr. Waitasek, it's a good thing you're here today. I want to thank you for uh, for sharing some of your memories with us, so we can uh, compile this uh, memoir of service, so that it will be part of the official record at the Library of Congress, and then here in your uh, community's library, and people can appreciate, uh, you know, the heroism of the greatest uh, generation. Uh, thank you very much for coming in. Okay, by the way, uh, yeah. you know, this Chicago Honor Flight. Yes. I got word from them that I would be on that Honor Flight on May 12th. Wow. I'll be going to Washington, D.C. I was telling the guys at the VFW, I'm not going to Disneyland, I'm going to Washington, D.C. I said, I got the call from uh, 
from these people that I would be on a flight. And my daughter's coming with me. She's going to be a, a caretaker. She's going to have to, you know, take care of two or three yeah. people that are disabled. They'll maybe push a wheelchair. And uh, my my daughter called them up and asked her. My my granddaughter is a nurse at Resurrection Hospital. She she asked if uh, if she we could get on that same flight. And they agreed. They, they let her come, so she's going to be on there. They told her to bring her first aid kits and everything. So the three of us are on May 12th, wonderful. Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's a wonderful uh, yeah. ac ac uh, activity or service. Yeah, I think one of the vets mentioned that at the, um, the last veterans breakfast we had here, one of the, Mr. Weinberg, he, he went on that trip, and oh, he, he thought it was wonderful. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So you'll be able to see the World War II Memorial and all that. I was in Washington, D.C. before it was completed, before wow. they had that World War II Memorial built. They said, come next year, and you'll, it'll be all finished. But uh, I didn't get there. Not, but now I, I'll get to see it. Yeah. All the, all the, all the you know, That's memorials terrific. that are there. Yeah. So I suppose you'll be, um, I might see you out on Memorial Day at the... At, uh, at, uh, at, yeah, at the waterfront. At the waterfall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm there every time. I think and so. I, yeah. In the Fourth of July parade, I'll be riding in a, right in, uh, in a vehicle, <laughs> not in decorated a, and everything. Yeah, not in a glider. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. So that's it, then. Huh? Oh, it was nice Thank talking you. with you. Yeah. Let me just uh, let's see. Stop.